Hello, thanks for coming by and visiting me and uh, listening to my rambling, rambling, rumbling, mumbling musings for my just... See, I, I, I bought a, uh, a pre-roll at the, at the marijuana store there um, in, in Spanaway, the gallery on the Pacific Avenue. So I bought a pre-roll. And I broke the I broke it open on the end, and I I smoked a little bit in a pipe, so I'm a little bit high on on under the influence of cannabis. Just let you know that off the, the from the beginning, so you maybe the I don't want to waste your time, right? Your time's important, and you need to you need to do what you got to do. Um, if if I'm interfering with anything it's important that you need to do right now, you shouldn't probably be listening to me or watching my video. Go do do what you need to do and get it done and you know. Um yeah, I've been thinking I I've been thinking about the, the, the antinatalism, you know, that idea that you can you can use logic and reason and and you can just you can try to explain to people why the idea of not procreating is a good idea, right? You could try to defend that. I had an audience right now of all these young people, like that were ready to get married and have start thinking about starting families. If you could address, if you could talk to them and try to convince them really good reasons not to have children of their own that it, it, the system well it could be they they should be encouraged to like adopt and we i was looking up a uh, foster parenting right so i went online and i looked up foster parenting and in the united states at least in washington state they pay They'll pay you to take care of a child, and there's different levels, tiers, or whatever, for the kind of how old the child is, or if it has special needs, or whatever. But they'll actually give you money to help pay for a child, to raise a child that's not yours, not your biological child. So there's already there's already set in place things, and then there's 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 the social services offices, like at the county, that the county has a health department and there's offices for uh social for social workers and there's there's available condoms right they have different bolt big bowls in the bathrooms they're in the men's room they had a big a big container of different condoms and i thought to myself i thought well if there's all these unwed mothers young teenage girls that are getting pregnant and then the, if if they if they're if they're making condoms making making means of birth control available for for uh, men young men there in that bathroom so i thought well that makes sense if you're if you're if you're trying to propitiate your constituents your taxpayers the people that pay the taxes in the community well they're they're using the taxpayers are paying for all these children from un, from because the county is having to subsidize their their food, their education, their medical, all the way to, the, to when they're eighteen, right? And they're they're if 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 they encourage the, if they encourage youth to to use prophylactics, the condoms. That I thought, yeah, that's, that makes sense. That's a good idea. That would be like preventing a pregnancy, you know. So it would be a good thing for that they were doing that. I thought, yeah, that makes sense that they're they're, they're get, making that available. So, so there is the government is not always. You would think, okay, the military needs young people at eighteen years old in the future. They need a youthful healthy youth population of youth youths to go and join up in the military on the in the army and the navy and the marines and 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 defending the country if if people don't if if all of a sudden everyone stops having kids 
then 18 years from now, who's going to, who's going to fill the shoes of the soldiers that need to like defend the borders and, and even like people that are like emergency workers or, or, or necess really necessary people to have in the community, right? Young that are, that are jobs that are usually filled by young people. So there is, there is some, there is some like, in the political sphere, there's a lot of nervous tension about the idea of antinatalism. They, it, it rattles people's cages. And I think that's one of the reasons it does rattle people's cages in a kind of a, in a kind of the, in the back rooms you'd hear about probably what that, that, that the military would be concerned about there being no young people to join up in the, in the army, you know, to, 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 to be defend the country. And then you have, and then you have a whole medical industry, right? That revolves around like pediatrics and children, and and that would have to that whole industry would have to change and shift over to geriatrics, taking care of the elderly. But you still need a population, a young pop keep, keep, to keep the population. If you just end the population, and everybody all of a sudden stops having kids is is our civilization really are we ready for that is that i i think people think it would happen all of a sudden it would just everyone everywhere would all of a sudden stop having kids i think some people are afraid of that and concerned about that happening what i just said about all of a sudden there being no kids anywhere no one was having any kids like that movie children of men which I thought was a stupid movie. I thought it was, it was, it really didn't have a very, it didn't have a very um, um, understandable plot line. There was kind of some, the plot was, uh, there were odd things happening. It was people were overreacting. I think it was, it was like two, they were trying to show it as a too emotional, right? But <clears throat> so you would have all these older people. And no one to take care of them, <clears throat> no one to run the water treatment plants or the or the or the nuclear power plants, no one to take the garbage out, no one to um, do the farming and but it's it it really kind of wouldn't happen all of a sudden if there was antinatalism in place as a policy, as a government policy, if they made it somehow like a, a requirement to be if you, if you didn't get us past a certain level of education then you were then you were given the option of being company of being sterile right you could you could they, they would pay people to step to become sterilized so if a young man said oh, i don't want a kid i never want to have a kid and they go to a place and they get a check for ten thousand dollars and they give them a vasectomy an re irreversible vasectomy and that's just one less person that would be having a kid and then not re not being responsible parent and it's and they would have an illegitimate child and there would be in a foster home and then the government would have to pay for that kid and on and on and on up until they're adult until they're 18 and then but if they paid the person like one tenth of that amount that it would cost to take care of a person for 18 years and just pay that to any any in individual that was like over a certain age, they could sign a cons waiver or consent and then have the operation done and receive a cash payout, have pay them off. And the same thing with women too, they could do that. And <clears throat> it would it would probably give a lot of people like there wouldn't be as many um unwed mothers. There wouldn't be as many on all these kids and there wouldn't be as many kids in the foster foster homes there wouldn't be as many kids coming up for adoption and being born to, to because of unwed because of, of people that just wanted to have sex they were committed to each other they just had sex and then the kid a kid happened from that and it had to be it had to have the whole system you know the all of the everything had to be the pay everything had to be resources used for that that person in their life right so instead of using that whole amount of money it would take to feed and clothe and educate that kid it would take one tenth of that or one a percentage of that and give that to the to the parents 
the potential parents to pay them off to and it would be all voluntary too it would be just they would get the money and then there was never there would never be a way to reverse it so i don't know that if you want if you're thinking of like population control in the future and it would be like a non-invasive population control it wouldn't be forced population control it would be voluntary population control so you'd make it, it would be socially more, I think it would be socially more palatable in that regard. So maybe that's all I should say on that. The other thing that was really bothering me was that I have pets, right? And they eat, they eat meat. You know, so I'm opening these cans of meat. And, and I think it was on one of Emendum's, um, on his Do Not God website. He has, a, he has his blogs. He has a video, but I I always I, I listen I download his vlogs there. He has the Google is evil on his <laughs> on his Inmendum account. So he doesn't really he, he points he does a video and then he just points to his 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 vlog or his video that they're on his website. So but he was saying something interesting about cat food, right? You get buy pet food and there's an animal there that's been ground up. Even if you're vegan, right, and you're trying to like Think about other animals in your life, you know, not by restricting your diet to just as plants as much as you can. Only eating uh, as much as you can eating plant-based foods, whether that be fresh vegetables and fruits, nuts, uh, grain, whole grains, um, and different kinds of uh, puree, coconut puree, almond puree, um, soy like soy things made out of soy or even like using vegan foods right using preparing dishes that are vegan dishes or buying the pre-made vegan you know i like the beyond meat and and the very good butchers very good food i like the um i really like amy's and they're but they're not publicly traded but i buy amy's i like the i like the enchiladas that are just vegetable enchiladas those are pretty good and the and the and the lasagna with the fake cheese, it has like lasagna, and I think it's diet cheese on the lasagna, but it's an Amy's product. And then there's um, Oatly, which just came out, and they went public. And there's they don't have it very often. They have it at Starbucks. If you order a coffee at Starbucks, if anybody there likes like Starbucks, next time you're at Starbucks, get the oat, get the oat to milk in your coffee instead of half and half you'll really it'll really be better you'll have a better coffee experience because i i thought half and half was like oh this is wonderful and then i then then i i learned about cows and what the cat what they go through on the farm and you know it, it, and it over time i didn't become like a vegan overnight you know i didn't go to a PETA meeting and then all of a sudden the next day for the rest of my life i was vegan and i grew up in a in a in, a, in the 60s it was my parents bought but lamb chops and polish sausages and, st and steaks and roasts and, and turkey and chicken and, and pork ch pork and bacon and eggs and and milk and butter all the time and fish every meal every meal had either a, a animal products in it or meat since when i was a kid all the way to when i was 18 19 years old and then after that i was more vegetarian but i but i it, it was hard to be vegan at that time in the 70s and 80s you had to like just buy vegetables and produce and prepare your food there was no pre pre-packaged foods and there weren't there weren't that many um plant-based milks either i think there was like soy milk and rice milk first the first the first milk substitutes so and then it was the 80s like and then it was more for me i was i if I had a choice, I would eat more plant-based if, if I could. But but I was eating eggs and cheese a lot, so I you know I didn't never. It was well, one of the things that like I went to the ten day vipassana, and when I was at the ten day vipassana, 
they have one meal in the morning and the breakfast is usually like it was like oatmeal and apples and prunes and, and whole wheat bread and um and they cut they had coffee there too and tea and they there wasn't any butter i don't think there was any milk dairy or butter or anything like that it was all vegan food salads and fresh um prepared foods vegetables beans rice and there was it 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 kind of made me change my diet there i wasn't a wholly committed vegan at that point i was still like a semi i was still had veg fish and vegetables or fish and butter and cheese once in a while and eggs too eggs were like somebody at work had chickens and they give me these they give me flats of eggs, right? And I, I just, I couldn't refuse them. <laughs> they were most a lot, a lot of they were really, they were pretty tasty actually most of the time. But I don't, I don't buy, I don't buy eggs at the grocery store. I have not bought eggs at the grocery store in a long, long, long time since that, since the early two thousands, which was two thousand and the year two thousand. I went to to my first Vipassana course. The first ten day one I went to, and I quit smoking there, um, cigarettes because I I remember driving up in the parking lot and I had my little pouch of top tobacco, and I would roll, roll my cigarettes. I either had I would hand roll them, or I remember smoking my last cigarette in my car there in the in the parking lot and going in and. I didn't know what it was going to be. I didn't. I didn't know what to expect there. But it was, it was very based on the book, you know, the art of living, the William Hart S. N. Goenka, and S. N. Goenka. He's the, he's the primary instructor there, that he learned from his teacher. Uh, I think his name was Sab. I may be mispronouncing it, but it was Saba Bujaya Kim. It was a. Um, and he had a monastery in Myanmar, which back then they called it Burma. And Goenka was a business fan from India who who took the class under Subhadaya Yanakian, and it was the class was like you you it's supposed you learn about meditation. That's it. Basically, you're learning how to meditate. And it's the, their method of meditation, which is called Vipassana, which is the latter, um, latter, latter type of meditation before you initiate. The initial meditation is called Anapanasati. In Anapanasati, you're, you're only thinking about your breath coming in and out of your body. While you're, while you're maintaining an alert posture, you're sitting, you're sitting up in a seated position where you're alert you're not going to fall asleep and the first four days is all on meditation on the breath and then the, the other half of the course is the is the vipassana bahavana where you where your your attention that you would have on your breath instead of being always on your breath you you're using your attention while you're sitting to to um, become aware of how you feel in other parts of your body, so you become you become you concentrate your your attention on how your body feels. Once you learn to only think about how your breath is feeling in in coming in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out of your airway. Your, all your attention's on your breath coming in and out, in and out, in. Breathe in, breathe out, breathe in, breathe out, breathe in. And you're doing that. And then the other, then once you get really good at that, then your mind clears. You don't have the, the monkey talk, the chattering inside. I, I didn't. And I lost the chattering. And then you're for, all you are is you're just like this. You're just always aware of your body. You're aware of your body more in the course as it, as it progresses forward. It's not much. If you think meditation is about things that are like that are not natural, 
that you're going to experience something that's not a natural experience. If you think you're going to try to meditate and have an experience of something unusual or odd or not norm, a normal experience that you would have, you, you can't, it's not that way. It's, there's nothing that's magical about it or there's nothing that's, um, that gives you a, an advantage or anything like that. All you're doing is you're, you're becoming more aware of your own body. And the breathing is just, that's where you start. That's your anchor point. That's your point of, of initial initiation is starting breathing and just working on observing your breath coming in and out, coming in and out. And the setting, the the meditation um, session, it only lasts an hour, and then you have a break. So they do that, and it's done eight times during the day. You have eight, and there's two times where you're you're in your in your in the dormitory on your bed, or you can be out on the grounds on a on a bench or seated seated somewhere. During those those time periods, during your break time, and it was the whole the whole ambiance of, and the course was all set up to make it easy to meditate. And the key, actually, I've been the three the three times I've been because I've signed up for three different I finished three different um, meditation classes there at Dhamma, Dhamma Kunja in on alaska washington it became more aware apparent to me that i really had to listen carefully to the lessons in the morning that were given by at mr goenka and he's there and the, they have a video of him in the in the after in the afternoon too he gives a talk um, on a video and then there's there's a, there's lessons during the day during the morning there's a lesson and it's only audio. But but Mr. Goenka, he is very specific. He gives you very precise instructions on how to meditate while you're in the course. And there's there's some chanting that's traditional that's like in Pali language, right? That's chanting and it's Buddhist. It's it's more Theravada Buddhism and that Theravada Buddhism is the Buddhism, Buddhism of the monastery. The, the popular Buddhism where it's statuary and incense and, and, and rituals, that's more commonly known in the public as Mahayana Buddhism. And that's, that's a kind of more of a popular religion of Buddhism. But, but, but the real, but the meditating part of the Buddhism is the Theravada, which is the old school. And it was passed down from teacher to student to over many generations. And, Yisaba Hayana Kim, I'm sorry if I mispronounced. He he taught Goenka that method, the Vipassana meditation method. And you 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 go there and you sign a, you sign an agreement that while you're there you're gonna you're gonna obey all the rules, you're gonna do everything told that you're supposed to do told to you by the by the assistant teachers. And follow their 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 itinerary. Be be there in the in the hall. They had a meditation hall where the women were on one side and the men were on the other side. And they give you different sizes and styles of cushions, as well as little um, Japanese meditation benches. If you have problems with your buttocks, if it gets sore, if you need to move while you're meditating, you're told you know move really slowly so you don't break your train of thought. That's another thing I learned that I was, if I get uncomfortable, I'd move too fast and then I would lose my, my attention would be off, would be thrown off. The first few days are the most difficult part because you're trying to get over your own inner talk, your own, what's happening up in your own head, right? You, once you get past that, your inner dialogue and that and it shuts up and you're just quiet. You're in, you're, you're able to just sit there and focus your attention on the breath and, in your body being, becoming aware of the body specifically. You're not, there's nothing like there's no, there's no visions or like out of body experiences or 
there the, for yeah i i think i remember having some odd dreams and they put me in a tent because i snored so i was not able to sleep in the dormitory with the other men that were there uh, because I would snore and so they gave, they gave me a tent it was in the in the summer and I slept outside in the tent it was actually pretty nice it's very nice experience sleeping in that being in the tent outside And I worked in the kitchen. I, my third course I served, and I worked in the kitchen, and I did the dishes. And I, I did help in the kitchen prepare food for the meals. And I talked too much. You see, you're not supposed to talk to anyone when you're there. You're... The only time you, you talk to a person there is if you're if it's necessary to do so. Otherwise, it's all silent. You're perfectly quiet. No one's talking to anyone else. It's all you're you meditate, you're there, and your you your mind frame your mindset is I'm here, I'm all by myself doing this. I'm not interfering with anyone else that's doing meditating. And then the ninth day, you're allowed to um, interact with the other students there, which is kind of, that's an interesting time um, during the course. You meet, you meet kindred spirits, you know, while you're there, you know, people that are like a lot, a lot you have the same kind of, you know, thinking about, about, about spirituality. <clears throat> but the Western thinker is, you have to be active all the time. You have to be doing something. You have to be thinking. You have to be exerting yourself. You have to be making yourself productive or moving or exercising. The Eastern way is you sit and you're really still and you're just like letting go and you're meditating and you're not, you're not doing anything. You're actually doing nothing. All you're doing is just sitting there, breathing, and maybe digesting your food um, and sitting really still. And then while you're... You're sitting there, your body, you're just you in by all by yourself with your body, but there's other people in the room with you too. But you don't you don't give any attention to the other meditators. You're just there and you close your eyes, find a really comfortable cushion, or use a little meditation bench. And there's or you could use a chair too. There's no there's no um there's no you don't have to have your med meditate in a certain posture. There's no strict requirements about meditating in the lotus position. If your body is supple enough and you can your 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 limbs and joints can 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 um, fold over comfortably with yourself seated in that position, then it's optimal for you to do that. But if you're somebody that's awkward, you're not used to sitting still in one and not moving in one spot for a long time. Your bottom will get sore. Your knees will get sore. You'll get like a your back might get a little sore, a little uncomfortable because you're trying to st be still. And the the only remedy for that is observe it and, and go back to observing your breath. And if it really is just uncomfortable for you, you need to move and reposition yourself and do it in like slow motion. So you move yourself and stay seated and not. Now, going through nicotine withdrawal after after being a smoker for like 30 years in my life 28 years so after being a smoker smoking a pack a day for 28 years uh it was it was hard for me i i i, had, I got up in the in the in the meditation hall and i started crying and blowing my nose and i was like i was getting all like anxious and depressed and and feeling like like really awful i felt really bad and was going through the nicotine withdrawal and i managed to go, go, stay in the course and be quiet and sit still for the rest of the days i was there and, it, and i got good results i quit smoking actually it was i remember smelling a cedar tree yeah it was beautiful wonderful i could smell the food in the kitchen more and my all the food tasted so much better it was like it was like the whole tobacco thing just just re got was removed from me. I had no no desire or no interest in tobacco ever since then. That was the year two thousand. 
in July. So I just thought I'd share that. It was an interesting part of my life. And and I, I did it all on my own. You know, I thought I got a book at the bookstore and I read the book. And the book at Marymore Park, I used to <clears throat> go by Marymore Park, which is near the Microsoft campus in, in Redmond, Washington, um, near uh, Lake Sammamish. And I'd, I'd stop there and I'd sit on the sit on the on the picnic table and I'd like just sit there really, really still and breathe. I would follow what the book said about breathe about observation to your breath. But I still smoked cigarettes at the time, so and then in the book it said did it's it's best if you're not to do this on your own, but to get guidance and and to take the class. There's a course you could sign up for. So I looked at the back and there was a, a an address and I wrote a letter to them and I emailed them and, and enrolled myself in the class. And it was it was every time I've gone, I've 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 grown a lot in my personality and how I how I view how I deal with my own issues of my past childhood and trauma I've been through and things that have happened in my life. So it's like you just sitting there. <laughs> and my last session I had there, the last course I took at Dhammakunja, I think it was in 2000 and, oh, 2002, I think, or three. That was all about my my childhood, growing up, where the street I lived on, the school I went to, the, the grade school, the teachers I had, the summer camp, and the, the traveling, and the, the experiences that I had with my brothers and sisters and, and, and cousins and neighbors and the whole meditation time, it was like that was my main thing. It was like that was that was my that was my thing I had to get over. I had to get over that, all that all that experience. I had to just take it in, look at it, see it for what it was, and, and go on and go forward in my life. But that 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 last time I went to the ten day Vipassana, that all of my issues kept coming up in my past and my growing up in my youth and just you do remembering all the dumb things I did and places I went and people I knew and events that happened and circumstances that were happening to me when I was growing up and living on my old neighborhood, right? And going to school and stuff. So I and dealing with the relatives and having interactions with my cousins and coworkers. But the second time I went. The second time was really it was it was it was just being blissfully like feeling really good. I felt like I was clean, you know. That's what I remember the second time being it was more my second ten day was more cleansing for me. Um Yeah. To anybody out there that's interested in the, in it, it's if you're interested in learning maybe a different technique of meditation. You can you can look up the vipassana dot org and they'll send you you can you can find a, a, a you can find a, a a course that's nearby to you and the first one you do is free they don't ask for anything when you join in when you sign in as long as they if they approve your application you'll take the course and then when the when you're done with the course they'll they'll they you could be you could you could give them a donation. They ask for a donation. You don't. You're not obligated to give them anything, because all the courses that they give there, there's there they've been paid for by other students. So it's like it's a yeah. So it's it's a five hundred one c, but it's a very serious thing if you're really serious about learning how to meditate. Um, I would highly recommend anyone out there that's interested in meditation to try it out to do it and you might you might find out that you you might discover things about yourself you know that you don't know as well as you know that you would know after you meditate for a long time i don't know what to tell i don't know what to say that 
the technique that the, the second part of the course, which, which, uh, <clears throat> which is not so much focused on, on the attention to the breath, the second parts, you use that, you use the, the, the technique of the breath observation and you take that same attention that you give to your feeling the air coming in and out, in and out, sitting there and just, just with your eyes closed, thinking about air coming in, air going out, air coming in and air going out. And that attention you, you give to the, to your nose and that you, you move that around to different parts of your body. <laughs> that's a, that's a all, that's a, everything. I explained that the, the, I explained the second half of the course right there in a nutshell and all the, the teacher is guiding you through doing that. Be so you're like you're a voyager that's traveling inside of your own body. So imagine yourself being really small, you know, and traveling around inside of your own body. So your consciousness. While you're meditating, your consciousness is, I'm thinking of my hand, I'm thinking of my skin, I'm thinking of the skin on my hand, I'm thinking of my fingertips, I'm thinking of my, under my fingernails, I'm thinking of my skin, I'm thinking on my hand going in you. And in the course, in the class, it's, they, part of the instructions is how to move your, how to move your, um, or your attention to different, or in your body and it, around inside of your body, how to move your attention that you give to your breath, that attention you're, you're moving in and you're moving it to, you're giving it to different parts of your body. And it's like, if you don't, if you don't get past the Anapana, Sati, once you get past and, and really get good at Anapana, Sati, which is observation of your breath, once you get good at that and you figure out how to make yourself comfortable for sitting long periods of time and you've you've gotten through the first day or two and the first day or two you got all the annoyances of your board or your you got a and you got an inkling to get up and do something else or go something else you got another urgent thing you got to do but you can't do that because you sign up for this course and you commit yourself for 10 days there they're only they they do not they don't they don't like it when people like take the first day and then they leave. It's preferred that if they come and they sign up for it, that they stay the whole time and they don't break their commitment. Um, and you want to, you want to be as the least amount of distraction to the other meditators as you can possibly be. So you want to be as considerate of their, of their, they're wanting to learn and have a meditation experience without you disturbing them with like um, humming or, you know, doing a nervous thing, tapping on some or, or, or like doing unnecessary coughing or, or making distracting, being a distraction and not those, those people, they, they don't never. They may never. Sh they maybe have never should have signed up for the course because they're they're they just can't have the they just can't sit still, you know. So that's all I got to say. I I would I would really wish that no more people that knew me that watch my videos, they would like say, yeah, I went and I did a ten day vipassana. And they would say, "Yeah, what did, did you? What kind of experience did you have when you did it?" Because mine were like very visceral. There was nothing. There was only one time I really did. I saw a face in the sky. I, there was clouds, and it was it was a cloud formation, and it looked like it it looked like Emerson, Lake, and Palmer, but there was only two of them. So it looked like that album where there where the three their three faces are turned to the side, their portraits their portrait um, photos of Emerson, Lake, and Palmer on the album cover. Well, there was two faces, and that and I remember one of them turned and looked at me, and the other one was still looking. I could only see its its profile, and I saw it, and I looked at the cloud, and I looked, and I saw a face in the cloud, and 
And it was kind of like, what? You know, I thought, am I just, am I imagining this? And I thought, now in retrospect, I think I just was having a hallucination. Like I really was, because I was sitting for so long, I was deprived, de sensory deprivation. I wasn't used to that. Because you sit with your eyes closed for an hour, and then you have a 15-minute break, and then you sit for another hour, and then you have a break, and you have, or you have breakfast, or you get up at 4 a.m. and you go to the meditation hall and you sit until 6.30 a.m. and then you have breakfast. And then you have a break and then you go back and you sit for another hour and then there's a lesson and then there's another hour of sitting and then you have a lunch, uh, mid-afternoon break. And then there's another session where you're just seated and then you can make appointment to talk to the, uh, uh, um, to the assist one of the assistant teachers there. But dang, I wish I wish more people I knew would do it. I wish somebody would go, yeah, I did that. And, or they would acknowledge that it, they had done it too, you know, and gone on a 10-day and finished it. Um, but it's not, it's, it's not like you get bragging rights, right? There's nothing that makes you a superior person doing that. There's not a, you don't get a special power or is it, if anything at all, it makes you more sensitive person, which can be, that can be a problem. If you're too sensitive and you're, you're like too emotional and too like you have empathy too easily, then you're like, you can, you, you're a vulnerable person in the world. If you're not, and then you can't live in the, you, it's really difficult to live in, to live a life and to have, and to keep the habit of meditating. I've lost that personally. I don't, I don't ne never meditate now hardly. What I do do is I put I put my I have an MP3 player that plays off the, the plays a USB stick and I got like a thousand songs on that USB stick and it plays them one after the other after the other and it just loops it around the same the same thousand songs. And I'll I'll have music and I'll hear classical music, I'll hear jazz music, I'll hear some country, I'll hear some folk, I'll hear some um dance music and then i'll hear rock music and then metal and then um and when the, when the music comes on that's popular music that i can dance to then i start dancing around my house if somebody were here watching me if there was a camera there watching me um i would i feel like when i'm dancing i feel like i'm on a stage in new york like on broadway and i'm one of the dancers on the stage when I have my eyes closed and I'm moving my body and I'm dancing, I want to. I want to imagine that I'm at a like um, a really expensive resort in the Baja California somewhere in Mexico, and I'm uh, or I'm on a cruise ship or I'm somewhere where there's a big party going on. And while I'm my eyes are closed and I'm dancing to the music, I imagine that I'm on this really nice, really resort on the beach. And I'm at a party, right, with all these other people, and we're all dancing. And then I, I pick up my weights, you know, my dumbbells and my my copper bars and, and my little five-pound weights. Um, actually, I got one five-pound, and I got a two, two and a three-pound. So I pick those up, and I, and I, and I'll like do like different positions i'll hold the weights up and i'll move the weights around and i'll i'll sh push the weights forward move them back and i'll i'll shift my body around a lot while i'm and i'm dancing and i'm i'm lifting weights and then i get on my elliptical bicycle and i pedal i go and i go and i go and i go pedal 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 until i'm like sweaty and really tired and then i'll lay down and go to sleep i sleep and i um it's a bed it's actually a medical bed it's made for a single person. It's got the, the, the knees can come up. The back can come up. It's all electric. I bought it. I got it for my wife when she was ill. She actually died in this bed. <laughs> my neighbor's daughter says, oh, he's weird. He sleeps in the, in the, in the bed in the dining room because <laughs> the bed is because <laughs> I put this bed for my wife so she could look out the, the sliding glass door and see the outside and there's another big window there this part of the house 
it's supposed to be a dining room, right? But the bed is here. It, I have the TVs all set up for watching movies. And the bed is, is at an angle in the house. <laughs> and someone would say, oh, your wife died in that bed. Oh, you sleep in that bed. But I don't care. I paid money for it. It's comfortable. I use it. So, And I can look, look out the window and watch the bird feeders and I watch my TVs. I have my TVs positioned just right. So. For me, I'll, I'll just get old and I'll die here, you know, in this house. I'll, this will be my last place I live here is this house. I'll have this bed, which is like, <sighs> so it's weird. It's funny. I'm, I really like this girl, Annie. I like her. I, I really like her a lot. And I'm, I'm like, I like, I like think that, oh, I got to, what can I do to make her happy? I just, I love to make this, this woman happy. Whatever I can do to make her feel good or do something for her nice. Um, it, it just, it brings me joy when I see her smile and she's all happy and relaxed and smiling. And I feel like, wow, I just, my presence with her made her just feel so, you know, we're, we're, we, we, we enjoy each other's company, you know, it's, it's so important, you know, in a relationship. And, and I said to her, well, you, we've known each other almost a year, so I'll just, I'll just make you my, because, because I don't live nearby relatives, right? I live pretty far away from any, any family members where I'm at, but my family I'm single. I don't have any kids. I don't never had kids, and I'm. Um, I have an estate. It's 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 the nothing. It's just a, a little, a little ding, a little tiny house, you know. With, um, and I have some some assets, right? Bank accounts and stocks and that. So I gave her, I made her the designated beneficiary for my for my Robin Hood account. So if I die, which it's an interesting <laughs> then she'll get the she's a designated beneficiary of my Robin Hood account. So and then my stepdaughter she has she gets my 401k. She's a designated beneficiary of my 401k. But my bank accounts which I don't really keep a lot in most of the time. They're just there for paying bills. I don't, there's nothing. That in my house, I need to figure out a way to do the to do a quick to do the claim, a quick claim at, at the time I die to whomever, the trustee of my of my house of my real estate. So I don't know about you guys out there. If you own a house, what do you? And if you're not if you're not married and you don't have any kids and you own a house and or you have assets and do you like have you do you do a will have you done a will what's your for someone in my situation what would you what would you what would you recommend for me you know, how should i go about you know i just think it's whomever you love and care about <laughs> for the first person on the list as long as there's but getting married is no. I'm not. Never. 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 Ever going to get married. No, that's out of the question. I'll. I'll. I'll make her the. She can be the designated beneficiary though. Of my, my accounts. I and I. 